a Monday in July. Raleigh, North Carolina. A procession moves toward the State House. Once inside, they block doors and passageways, knowing it will get them arrested. They are part of a movement that's become known as Moral Mondays. Thousands rallying, protesting at the North Carolina State House for a week. called Moral Monday. It's a protest against the, the state. the Moral Governor. Mondays protest here in Raleigh, North Carolina. In a state like North Carolina, in the South. Touch your neighbor and say, we in the South. We in the South. Tell the media, this ain't Wisconsin. This, this is the South. This is the South. Where justice was hammered out. Justice where freedom was hammered out. This is the South. More than a dozen protesters are still in police custody hours after taking a stand. With the protest began with a small gathering on a Monday in April. Then their numbers started growing, Monday after Monday. Each week there are more arrests than the week before. Tonight there were 49. The rallies kept growing through the spring and the hot Carolina summer. The 13th wave of the Moral Monday protests. Crowds grew so large, police had to shut down a portion of Lane Street in downtown Raleigh. By August, citizens were turning out in town after town across the state. Asheville police telling us 5,000 or more gathered here in downtown Asheville. And the nation was taking notice. Moral Monday organizers say the media attention they're generating outside the General Assembly makes up for much of the political power they lack on the inside. The protesters are challenging a relentless right-wing crusade to remake the laws of the state. In North Carolina, they are trying a new way to get people back to work. They're cutting off unemployment benefits. North Carolina passed one of the most restrictive voter suppression bills. Lawmakers in the state house and senate just voted to prohibit expansion of Medicaid. Executions will soon resume here in North Carolina. Dropping the state income tax and adding a higher... For the first time in almost 150 years, Republicans control the governorship and both houses of the legislature, where they have a veto-proof majority and they're using their monopoly of power to enact laws the Charlotte Observer says will touch every North Carolinian's pocketbook, every student's classroom, and every voter's experience at the poll. The extreme right wing, they have overstepped so far. They seem to be targeting those who can least afford to pay for these changes. We've just kicked 71,000 of our neighbors off of the benefits to keep roofs over their head and food on their table. What they are doing to public education is a travesty. The legislature wants to lower the age that we can be tried as adults to 13. Day or night. We are here to save the soul of our state. At an age of 92, I am fed up and, and fired up. I said fed up, fired up, fed up, fired up, fired up. Thank you so very much. North Carolina has, in some ways, a uh, bipolar political culture. Adam Hochberg teaches journalism at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. A lot of people from outside North Carolina, when you say North Carolina, the first thing they think of is Jesse Helms, who was, of course, a stalwart of the hard right and was our senator here for more than 20 years. Homosexuals, lesbians, disgusting people marching in our streets demanding all sorts of things, including the right to marry each other. On the other hand, North Carolina is the home of a lot of progressive politicians. At the same time that Jesse Helms was in the Senate in the 80s, uh, Terry Sanford was his counterpart in the Senate, who is one of the best known Southern progressive liberals. We need to remind ourselves that protest, even obnoxious and blood boiling protest, is the fundamental ingredient of a free people. 
Our state constitution says... Today, the state's progressive leader is William Barber. Before the right-wing takeover, his coalition had pushed for a string of successful reforms, including raising the minimum wage and measures increasing voter participation. Because this right to vote and to fight for it is not just political, it's personal. Reverend William Barber is the head of the North Carolina NAACP. He is, uh, he is a man, if you're ever in the room with him, you'll know he's in the room. And we have come to serve notice that we will unleash every political, legal, and moral strategy that we can to create the New South, but we will not go back. Well, fundamentally, America constantly finds itself in where the question is a moral question. How are we going to live out our deepest moral principles of doing justice, loving your neighbor? And what does that mean in terms of our laws and our public policy? Barber was arrested on the first Moral Monday back in April. On the news, he declared he was protesting an avalanche of extremist policies. That threaten health care, yeah. that threaten education, yeah. that threaten the poor. One of the things that particularly upset people um, is we saw cuts to long-term unemployment assistance. Journalist Sue Sturgis covers North Carolina politics for the progressive Institute for Southern Studies in Durham. It wasn't a lot of money in the first place, but it was a safety net. And so one of the things we've seen as part of the agenda that's now being played out in Raleigh is constant snips and cuts and tears to that social safety net. It's no longer a priority for the people who control the state. 31 yeses and 17 noes. The vote tonight on Senate Bill 4 to block the expansion of Medicaid. The Republican refusal to expand Medicaid meant denying health insurance to half a million people. How can you stand up and say, I just cut 500,000 people's uh, access to Medicaid and it's the moral thing to do? They decided that they're not going to expand Medicaid. And this was going to do great damage to my patients. And so I take that very personally, that I'm not a person who just takes care of hearts and livers, but I need to take care of their the whole body and the whole person. Dr. Charles Vanderhorst is an infectious disease specialist at the University of North Carolina. What had happened is that April 29th, Reverend William Barber had had a rally against these policies. So I thought, hmm, I should check this out. So on Monday, May 6th, I went along and ended up doing civil disobedience and getting arrested. And I deliberately made some decisions in subsequent rallies that I, I stand next to him. Okay, I wanted there to be an old white guy in a white coat with a stethoscope standing next to him. We're going to walk together and go forward until, until love is lifted, until justice is realized. He's trying to build a multi-issue, multi-racial coalition in North Carolina. Ari Berman has been covering the Moral Mondays movement. There's this feeling that social justice is under attack and that people have to get in the streets to make people care, to dramatize what's happening in the state. The conservative ideology the Moral Mondays protesters are fighting isn't new. What's new is that just about everything on the right-wing wish list for the past four decades is at last becoming reality, just as our Pope planned. What happened in North Carolina? Well, his name is Art Pope. That's what happened. I'm Art Pope, and I'm a Java creator. Hey, hey! Ho, oh, ho! Oh. Art Pope has got to go! In public, the man most often fingered as the mastermind of the right-wing takeover presents himself as just a low-key member of the governor's cabinet, running the numbers like an earnest accountant. This budget anticipates revenue-neutral tax reform. He's self-effacing. Are you the rainmaker of the North Carolina Republican Party? No, the voters are the rainmakers of the North Carolina Republican Party. But Art Pope wields so much power here that he's been called everything from kingmaker to king. Pope is very, very rich. 
and he has shelled out so many millions of dollars for conservative causes and Republican candidates that his adversaries accuse him of buying the state government. Pope claims that's not what the money's for. Of course I think it has an impact, but the impact is educating the voters on the issue so they hear both sides of the issues, not just one side. There are wealthy individuals who have outsized influence in many states. Usually there's a handful of them. Jane Mayer of The New Yorker was the first national journalist to investigate Pope's power. But he really dominates the landscape in North Carolina in the way that nobody else does. That's because he practices the golden rule of modern politics. He with the gold rules. And Art Pope has the money, his own, his company's money, and money from the John William Pope Foundation, named for his wealthy businessman father. That single foundation has spent some $46 million on a network of advocacy groups and think tanks bent on steering North Carolina far to the right. Sound familiar? When people talk about Art Pope, someone who's often invoked are the Koch brothers, um, David and Charles Koch, who also run a privately held company and spend a great deal to promote their particular brand of libertarian politics. And he's very close to the Kochs. He served as a board member of Americans for Prosperity, which is a conservative policy advocacy group that was founded and is funded by the Koch brothers. In some ways, Art Pope is sort of a, a junior-sized version of the Koch brothers. He has a, um, what some people call a kind of a, a, a factory production line for his ideology. Um, the people that work for his think tanks are on the radio, they have websites, they have publications that are statewide. They get their message out all the time. Like this message, aimed right at the Moral Mondays protesters. Backed by a supportive liberal media, hundreds have been arrested for disrupting the state legislature. Million dollars it accuses protest leaders of marching to protect now, access to government handouts. These organizations are fighting to keep their spot at the public trough. Welcome to Money Monday. Francis DeLuca once ran the North Carolina chapter of the Koch Brothers Americans for Prosperity. He's now head of the John William Pope Civitas Institute. So Civitas Institute is heavily funded by um, the Pope Foundation, but I can tell you having now worked at Civitas for seven years and run it for um, almost six years, Art Pope's control over Civitas is very little. He likes policy. I always try to describe Art as a policy wonk. He believes in a vigorous debate, even among his different groups. If you check, you will notice that our groups do not always agree. The groups he's fund do not always agree on policy. Perhaps not always, but certainly often enough. For example, on cutting tax rates for corporations and the rich, which is exactly what the state recently did. By 2015, the highest earning North Carolinians will pay almost 26 percent less in income taxes than they did in 2013. Corporations will pay over 27 percent less. There's also been a repeal of the estate tax, which applied only to people so wealthy that just 23 families had paid it in the year 2011. When corporate and wealthy interests are at stake, Art Pope is right at home. Where did Art Pope get the money and the ideas that have reshaped the politics of North Carolina? The story begins when he was a young man. He was a very intellectual kid, and very early on, he went to a summer program that was run by the Cato Institute, the libertarian think tank. And he was quite swept up with libertarian ideology and the ideas of Ayn Rand. Once he was through college and he went to Duke Law School, he eventually became the general counsel in the family firm. And then he rose in the firm. All the way to the top, becoming CEO of that family firm. It's a privately held company called Variety Wholesalers. It was started by his forebears. It's a discount retail chain. These are usually lower end discount stores than, than a Target or even a Walmart or a Kmart store. They go by a variety of different names. Uh, one of the largest chains he owns is called Roses. Uh, there's one called Max Way. He has great personal wealth and great family wealth. And he had great political ambitions. Pope served in the legislature for several terms back in the 1980s and into the 90s. Art is a, uh, he's a very bright man and he knows the state budget and he knows numbers. 
inside and out, but he is not what you'd call the stereotypic political candidate. You know, the smiling, telegenic politician. And after a couple years, he ran for lieutenant governor and lost badly. And he realized he was not going to influence North Carolina politics by being lieutenant governor or governor. He was just unlikely to, to get elected. Turns out he didn't need to get elected to win elections. He just had to put his money where it counted. He first set out to purge moderate Republicans from the state assembly by supporting candidates to their right in GOP primaries. And then, in 2010, he took on the Democrats, who played right into his hands. The Democrats were in disarray in 2010. Um, there had been a series of scandals in the party, um, corruption scandals. A Democratic governor had pled guilty to a felony campaign finance charge, and that wasn't all. We had a Democratic Speaker of the House go to prison on a bribery scheme. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of sleaze in the Democratic Party. We saw a backlash against President Obama and Obamacare, which is the same thing we saw nationally. We saw frustration over a lousy economy, which was the same thing we saw nationally. Also, that election was right after the Citizens United Supreme Court decision that opened up the door to outside money. That Citizens United decision, the handiwork of the conservative majority on the Supreme Court, enabled corporations and individuals to spend unlimited amounts of often untraceable money, what's now called dark money. He provided a perfect example of how the landscape had changed after the Citizens United Supreme Court ruling. Well, break those numbers up. He so saw the opportunities, and he had the cash because of his family fortune. Art Pope's a very smart man who is almost thinks about the world almost like an engineer, and it's as if somebody had looked at the map in every single district and figured out what it would take to get Republican control. And so he, along with some of the people he was working with, targeted legislative races to pour money into. One of their vessels was a front group called Real Jobs NC, co-founded by Art Pope and bankroll by one of his companies and a national Republican group, its real job was to demolish the other side. And in 2010, it went on the attack. Putting Raleigh liberals first. Their high taxes and wasteful spending cost us jobs. Her priorities are costing us jobs. Real Jobs NC sponsored this ad. That year, he and his family and also the outside spending groups that he's associated with spent $2.2 million on state legislative races. Which, in the national scheme of things, is not a tremendous amount of money. But in the context of a state and in the context of state legislative races, where really there's not usually that much money spent, it, it was decisive. Tonight's shift in power is historic. The Republicans have taken control of both chambers for the Republicans are now in control for the first time in more than a century. So how big of a role does Pope himself think he played? I supported 19 Republican legislative candidates that I contributed to and 17 of those won. That's a pretty good track record. I'm glad. The 2010 election, uh, Republicans got control of both houses of the state legislature, first time since just after the Civil War. And the Republicans were very smart. You know, they, they realized that there was an opportunity there. Whoever controlled the legislature in 2010 would control the state's political future. The winners would control the future because 2010 was a census year, the first in a decade. That means they get to control the redistricting process. So as you can imagine, that's an opportunity for legislators to do some pretty self-serving things, and it was the same thing when Democrats were in charge. With computers nowadays, you can get very specific about every house that's included in the district, and you can know What's a Republican neighborhood? What's a Democratic neighborhood? So you can look up at an individual house and say, OK, the, the man of the house is a Republican, and the lady of the house is a Democrat. And I see they have one adult son living at home, and he's also a Republican. I mean, you can do it to that level. And you can draw districts in such a way that pretty much foretells which party is going to control that district. And what the Republicans did was draw districts as best they could to elect Republicans. They had help, according to the investigative group ProPublica, 
help in the form of dark money from outside sources and Republican operatives coming down from Washington to help figure out the boundaries most favorable to their party. But there was someone else in the room, too, Art Pope. One person present told ProPublica, we worked together at the workstation. He sat next to me. When the next election came around, 2012, the gerrymandering worked like a charm. The 2012 election occurs, and it is the best election for Republicans in modern history in North Carolina. They take not just control of both houses of the state legislature, and they had not done that in a century, but they take overwhelming control. They take a veto-proof majority control of both houses of the legislature. They also get the governor's mansion back for the first time in 20 years. Let's forget about politics for a while and think about us. That's what we tried in Charlotte when I was mayor. As mayor of Charlotte, Pat McCrory was known to be a fiscal conservative, but on other issues, fairly moderate for a Southern Republican. I'm Pat McCrory, and I'm running for governor. Governor McCrory, in one of the debates before the 2012 election, was specifically asked by somebody on the panel in a televised debate, would you sign any measures to further restrict abortion in North Carolina? And he said flat out no. If you're elected governor, what further restrictions on abortion would you agree to sign? I'll start with you, Mr. McCrory. None. All right. <laughs> but once in office, McCrory swung hard to the right, beginning with the casual announcement of a key appointment. Art Pope has agreed to serve as my deputy budget director. Say what? Art Pope has agreed to serve as my deputy budget director. An innocuous title, masking a startling reality. The man who for years had poured money into those right-wing think tanks, into the Republican Party, and into Republican campaigns, including Pat McCrory's, would now be the governor's man overseeing the state budget. His power is, is tremendous and very frightening to me that people can buy their way into that kind of power in what's supposed to be a people's democracy. Vicki Ryder sings at Morrow Monday protests with a group called the Raging Grannies. Several years ago, she moved from New York to North Carolina. After my husband and I retired, we were looking for a place to live that would be supportive of our values. And uh, the Triangle region of North Carolina seemed to be a good fit for us. So um, we have just been shocked by how quickly things have turned from a very progressive atmosphere to one of extraordinary regression. Conservatives were getting the results they had been praying for. Some examples. 75% of the tax cuts went to the top 5% of taxpayers. Anyone making more than, say, $250,000 a year would now pay a state income tax rate at the same level as those making $25,000. Earned income tax credits for the poor were cut. Budgets were cut for at-risk kids and pre-K, even as vouchers were given to private schools. Unemployment insurance was cut with a bill drafted by the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce. And in Art Pope's budget, the state's higher education system took a hit of $64 million. You've traditionally had a lot of support for education in North Carolina, especially for a southern state. And I think it's something that a lot of North Carolinians take, take pride in, not just, you know, pointy-headed liberal intellectuals, but a lot of people in the business community, too. And I don't think you'll find, even among Republican business leaders, this attitude of marginalizing higher education that you have seen from the state capitol. One of the first things that Governor McCrory did, one of the first controversies he got involved with as governor is he went on a conservative radio show, a national show, and took some swipes at the university and said there are too many degrees in liberal arts and he said if you want to get a degree in gender studies go to private school and do it the people in north carolina don't want to pay for that that's a subsidized course and frankly right. if you want to take gender studies that's fine go to a private school and take it but i don't want to subsidize that if that's not going to get someone a job and he said that if you wanted to study these things that you should go to a private college uh, rather than a rather than a public one which is not an option for so many of us. 
Molly McDonough grew up in Chapel Hill. She's a sophomore at North Carolina State University. I'm looking at legislation right now. In fact, I just instructed my staff yesterday, go ahead and develop legislation, which we change the basic formula and how education money is given out to our great. universities and our community colleges. Great, great. Are we it's at... not based upon how many butts and seats, but how many of those butts can get jobs. Excellent. How many employable butts. Okay. I can't remember the exact quote, but he said it was something weird. It was about like all the butts in seats need a job. My name is Molly McDonough, and I am 18 years old, so when I told my friends and my family that I was planning to get arrested, they were all very concerned about my future. And my response to that was, I am doing this so that I can have a future. The budget did more than strip cash from education. Among other things, it got rid of jobs for environmental regulators, cut funds for drug addiction treatment, even funds that help people with AIDS buy drugs the costly ones that would keep them alive. Sean Gorman is a hemophiliac who got HIV from a blood transfusion. He's been treated by Dr. Charles Vanderhorst since 1985. Again. And he was desperately ill very early with all sorts of horrible, horrible infections, mm -hmm. including you had CMV retinitis. Yep, that's I lost this eye. I don't have vision in this eye. Gorman gets his medicine through a program called AIDS Drug Assistance Program, ADAP. The Art Pope budget cuts $8 million from ADAP, and advocates say that's enough to prevent some 900 future AIDS patients from getting the life-saving drugs they need through the program. Yeah, people won't be able to buy their, you know, to afford to get their medications, then they'll do without, and then they'll get some crazy opportunistic disease go into the hospital and have huge hospital bills, which they won't be able to pay for. Right. The average hospital admission would be something like $100,000 for an opportunistic infection. Who's going to pay for that? Well, you and I will pay for that. That comes out of our health insurance costs. So not only is it not being a good moral person to take care of, it economically makes no sense. All right, we'll All see right. you in six months. Yeah, take care. All right, good thanks. luck. Yep, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. There have been other dramatic changes. For one, the election of state judges. I believe we're the first state in the country to enact public financing for our appellate court races, the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court. And the rationale was we didn't want judges running who are going to be uh, getting money from the lawyers who are going to be appearing before them to finance their campaigns. And it worked very well, and it's been very popular. Democrats and Republicans, men and women, black and white, across the board, it was a very popular program. But popular or not, the Art Pope Network wanted it gone, and Republicans killed that clean election system for judges. What further restrictions on abortion would you agree then to? Then there's sign? abortion rights. Start with you, Mr. McCrory. None. Remember that campaign promise candidate McCrory made in 2012? <laughs> Well, in 2013, Governor McCrory was singing a different tune. He says he'll sign a controversial abortion bill into law. Protesters tell NBC Charlotte reporter Rad Berkey that is a broken promise. Basically, the impact will be that 15 of the 16 clinics left in the state that provide abortions will have to shut down under the new standards. Moral Monday protesters say they barely recognize their state under the current regime. What has outraged them most is the state's new voting law, which cuts right to the heart of democracy. What do we do? To understand their outrage, you need to know a little history. For a long time, North Carolina didn't really have very strong voter turnout. Journalist Ari Berman is writing a book about voting rights. And then they did a number of things after the 2000 election to make it easier for people to vote. They, for example, expanded early voting. They allowed a same day of voter registration during that early voting period. And those kind of things started to propel North Carolina forward in terms of voter turnout. Those voting reforms were on display during the presidential election of 2008 when North Carolina swung toward the Democrats for the first time in decades. 
not least because early voting brought more people to the polls. On election day itself, there were actually more votes cast for John McCain than there were for Barack Obama, but Obama still won the state because more than half of all North Carolina voters in 2008 voted early, and early voters ultimately put Obama over the top. And so I think Republicans said, uh, we need to tamp down some uh, of these voters. We need to make it so that the electorate is older, whiter, more conservative, not younger and more diverse. And how better to do that than to push for strict voter ID requirements? And in 2008, that's exactly what the Pope Network began to do. There just has not been any kind of widespread voter fraud, but they repeatedly raise it as a concern in order to build a case for voter ID laws. Then you had candidates who were funded by Pope who said the same thing, so that there was some perception among elected officials that voter fraud was a problem, even though it wasn't. In order to restore confidence and accountability to our elections, we need voter ID. And passed this anti-voting legislation essentially based on the manufactured outrage that Pope had ginned up. In 2013, the right-wing legislature passed a new law that critics called a Voter Suppression Act, in part because its requirement for ID cards is most likely to affect the young, elderly, poor, and minority voters. And there's more. They cut a week off of early voting. They eliminated same-day registration during that early voting period. They expanded the number of poll watchers that can challenge eligible voters on election day. At the same time, they were eliminating pre-registration for 16 and 17-year-olds. One of the changes in the bill was this thing they call pre-registration, where they registered 16 and 17-year-olds, using the schools to register them. You know, I like to call this the Pedophilia Enabling Act. Where in the world can I go on a government website and find a list of 16-year-olds and their home addresses? I can go to the State Board of Elections. You, if you walked into a school and asked for that list, not only would you not get it, you would probably be arrested. They would send police to your home and say, why do you want a list of all our 16-year-olds in the school? There, there's really no evidence that pre-registering 16 and 17-year-olds endangers their security. There's no evidence uh, that it leads to voter fraud. And so uh, to get rid of something like that, I think, sends a very bad message to the young people in North Carolina. And I think that it's unfortunate because it's it seems to be part and partial of a pattern to make it much more difficult for a particular demographic to vote. And I guess I would say the bill is designed to make it more difficult for Democrats to vote, basically. If you don't want to take that from a Democratic legislator like Pricey Harrison, take it from a Republican county executive, Don Yelton, who admitted as much in his now infamous appearance on The Daily Show. The law is going to kick the Democrats in the butt. If it hurts a bunch of college kids that's too lazy to get up off their bohunkers and, and go get a photo ID, so be it. Right, right. If it hurts the whites, so be it. If it hurts yeah. a bunch of lazy blacks that wants their, the government to give them everything, so be it. Almost immediately, Yelton was forced to resign his position in the Republican Party. Rosa Nell Eaton, 92 years old. A citizen of Franklin County. I am before you today to speak on voting rights. We need more, not less, public access to the ballot. Her name is Rosanelle Eaton, and she has a very long memory, including crosses burning on her lawn and Jim Crow laws forcing segregation on black Americans far into the 20th century. My mother, Rosanelle, always believed that everybody should have the right to vote. She's registered approximately uh, probably over 4,000 people. She got an award for that. She was awarded. Uh, what is called the Invisible Giant Award. She would always have her little forms with her. She even has them now when she doesn't really necessarily have to, but she wants to make sure that everybody, if she'll see a person, she might ask them if they wish to vote. When she first registered to vote as a young woman, she faced a group of white men who put it to a test reserved for African-Americans. 
she was told if she wanted to vote, she'd have to recite the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. One of the men told me, stand up straight against that wall with your eyes looking directly toward me and repeat the preamble of the United States of America without missing a word, I did it. All right, we're ready to roll. And it really bothers her that voter suppression coming right back in the year 2013. She just never thought she'd have to be fighting this battle just on another type of turf. Bring it down. Bring it down. Everybody listen up. So let me tell you people. So let me tell you. Nobody in here, I don't guess, any older than I am. There's nobody in here any older than I am. But you need to get involved. Get involved. And when involved. something comes up, you be involved. When something comes up, you be involved. You won't have to learn. You, you won't have to learn new strategies. You just be You don't ready. have to learn new strategies. Be ready for them. Just be ready for them. So you all just keep on. Keep on. The General Assembly you have two minutes to disperse, so you will be arrested. Two minutes. On June 24, 2013, Rosanelle Eaton was arrested at the state legislature and charged with trespassing. Vicki Ryder was arrested in July. I think one of the things, frankly, that bothers me the most about what's happening is that we fought that fight. You know, I was there in Washington, D.C. 50 years ago when Martin Luther King delivered his I Have a Dream speech, and we thought that we were making some progress. It's a common theme among the protesters that today's battles hark back to earlier ones in the civil rights movement. Remember, North Carolina was where the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, started. Those sit-ins in Greensboro inspired the modern civil rights movement of the 1960s. Uh, and so there's a long history uh, in North Carolina of civil rights activism. And some of those very activists, people like Bob Zellner of SNCC, have been extremely active in the Moral Monday movement today. Well, I grew up in uh, L.A., in Lower Alabama, and uh, I was the first white Southern field secretary for SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and uh, I was one of the first 17 that were arrested in Morrow Monday. Our purpose in life is to work for those who are powerless. And what's happening now in the Moral Monday movement is on the same moral plane as what happened in the Civil Rights Movement. I gotta say, I think this is laughable. We're talking about the people in the Civil Rights era. We're talking about people being beaten. We're talking about people, when they were put in jail, they didn't get out of jail in time to go eat dinner that night. I am not questioning the individuals why they're doing it in their motivation. I am questioning the ones who try and equate it with the, the 60s and 50s and some of the great struggles in, in history. Protesters, however, say the Pope-funded Civitas Institute itself has reached back to the past and dredged up an ugly tactic used against civil rights activists. So what they did is put all our names, our occupations, our age, our race, uh, party affili affiliation, uh, and our employer and our salary if we were public uh, uh, employees. And we put all that up there, and we put up their party registration, which we just cross-checked public record to help identify what they were. It really harkened back, and this is what really upset people a lot, it really harkened back to a strategy that we saw during the mid-20th century civil rights movement, where people protesting Jim Crow, who were signing petitions against segregation, um, would have their names pulled off those petitions and put in the newspaper. And it was a way to encourage retaliation against them. Not necessarily violent retaliation, but you know, the employer might see your name there and maybe didn't want to hire a troublemaker. You know, I, I just don't understand that thing that on one hand, you're publicizing how you got arrested, but on the other hand, if we say it, it's intimidation. 
There's also an interactive feature on the Civitas site. Like there's this game called Pick the Protester where it has like three mug shots and it's like which person is retired, which person lives in Chapel Hill, which person has the last name of McDonough and you click on the mug shot of the person you think it is. Francis De Luca says the game is a fun way to get people to interact with the site and to prove that the protesters don't really represent North Carolina, that they are disproportionately white Democrats with more clergy and public sector workers than the state as a whole. The protesters say they indeed represent their state's diversity and that parts of the database are skewed. I, uh, I looked myself up and they have some inaccurate information there. They, they um, have one section of the spreadsheets that are uh, voting discrepancies. And so they say that I'm a registered Democrat, which I am, and then they say that I am registered to vote at the wrong address. Now, what they either didn't take into account or didn't you know, care to think through is that I'm a student. In November, I live in Raleigh on NC State campus, and my permanent address is in Chapel Hill. And so when I got arrested, I put down the address that they will always be able to contact me through, which is my mother's address. Um, and that's not where I'm registered to vote. You vote where you live. If I tell you, if I register the vote, I can tell you, if I get arrested, it's going to be the same place. Uh, my home address is the same place I vote. I mean, that's how it's supposed to be, that your domicile is where you vote. So if I'm telling you I get when I get arrested that I actually live somewhere else, but my registration is over here, then one of those two things is a lie. I think their intention was to intimidate others from uh, committing acts of civil disobedience. And instead, it's had the reverse effect. Mr. Poe, it's a waste of your money. See, they want us to come here today and be all upset about this site. They want to sucker us into a back and forth about people on a website so they can take the focus off the policies being passed and signed by them in the General Assembly and in the governor's office, but it will not work. But so far, what North Carolina's far-right government is doing is working. Clerk will lock the machine record the vote. 84 having voted in the affirmative, 32 in the negative. The motion passes. Protesters are powerless to stop the passage of a single law. Going back. It's true they aren't giving up. And so turn to your neighbor and say, let us not despair. Let us not despair. But neither are Art Pope, the governor, and the veto-proof legislature. Well, I think what's important is that what Art Pope has done in North Carolina could be done pretty much in any state. He's shown that one really wealthy individual can almost rule. And so we enter 2014 with one more reminder that America is a country where the wealthy almost rule. Money talks. Although when we offered Mr. Pope and Governor McCrory an opportunity to be interviewed for our report, they didn't respond. Luckily, some people are much more vocal, fighting back, saying enough is enough. And I don't just mean the Moral Mondays protesters. The U.S. Justice Department is challenging North Carolina's restrictive new voting law, arguing that it will have a disproportionate impact on minorities. And those new gerrymandered districts, engineered with Art Pope sitting in the room to ensure Republican dominance, are also being challenged in North Carolina's own Supreme Court. The charge is that they're race-based and therefore unconstitutional. Yet even there, in the state's highest court, money may affect the outcome. Take a look. A Republican political action committee in Washington sends over a million dollars to a political action committee in North Carolina called Justice for All, NC. That group then sends over a million dollars to a super PAC called North Carolina Judicial Coalition, which spends over a million dollars supporting Justice Newby's re-election. Now that Republican Political Action Committee in Washington, where the money started, is the same one North Carolinian Republicans worked with to gerrymander the state. That plan is being challenged by citizen groups as race-based and unconstitutional. So where do these citizens turn to seek justice? 
to the very state Supreme Court, one of whose members was re-elected with money from the partisans who drew up the redistricting in the first place. Justice can't be more corrupted than that. But when money rules, nothing is sacred or cheap. Which could explain why Art Pope, as we reported earlier, has waged a long crusade to kill the state's popular system of public funding for judicial races, a system created to prevent rich people like Pope and corporations from buying justice. Last summer, Pope succeeded, opening North Carolina's highest court to the highest bidders. Katie bar the door, except that no matter which door we're talking about, Art Pope has the key to it, and possibly to the future. Take the firepower of the rich, pour in heaps of dark money loose by the Supreme Court Citizens United ruling, add generous doses of fervent ideology, and presto, the battle for American politics and governance is joined. And every state becomes North Carolina, including yours.